hello, Antoinette. Thank you so much for joining us today at Monitano. Would you please let us know the incident, in which is the reason why we're having this, this interview? Okay. Um, I am Antoinette Houston. I am a, a police brutality survivor. Um, I was attacked by an off-duty officer, August 2013. I had driven back from a funeral. I'd been in Indianapolis all day, which is about two hours from here. And I drove back home into Louisville at 2.40 in the morning. I had my son asleep in the back seat. And I decided <laughs> to um, stop at a gas station and get a donut because I saw the donut truck. <laughs> I was just gonna grab a donut mm -hmm. and go home. Mm -hmm. And when I pulled in, I've got a small car and I'm really, I'm really guilty of kind of whipping my car into the parking space. This day I was very catty corner in the gas station. It was 2.40 in the morning, there were no cars. I didn't think it was a big deal. Um, I got out, I was on the phone. Mm -hmm. As I put my hand on the door, I heard a voice say, why are you parked that way? Mm -hmm. So I turned around, of course, and I could see I could see that there was a person in a car. I knew it was a man. I did respond and tell him that I was just going in to get a donut and I'd be right out. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you need to move your car. And I made a joke and looked around and and said be a mad rush of cars or something. And I kind of laughed. Well, he didn't think it was funny. Uh, he said, well, I'll just give you a ticket then. So when he said that, I assumed he was an officer. So I got back in my car immediately and I moved. As I was pulling forward to pull into the space, he walked into the space that I was pulling into. I pulled over to the right a little so I wouldn't get close to him with my car. I got out, um, he kind of met me at my door, kind of lunged at me is what I would call it and said, why don't you get off the phone? And I very nonchalantly said, sir, the car is moved. And I walked around the back of my car and proceeded into the store again, still on the phone. Um, as I put my hand on the door again, he said, give me your license. Um, so when he said that, when he said, give me your license, you're drunk, I laughed. I don't drink at all, but I just didn't, I didn't know where that was coming from. I laughed and I said, I'm not drunk. I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a breathalyzer. My son's in the back seat, but I don't drink. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, you are drunk. Come back here and see how you're parked. So when I walked back there, my back right tire was just like onto the line of the parking space. Uh-huh. I thought that was ridiculous. So I looked at him and he yelled at me and said, do I look like I'm effing joking? And I, and, but he yelled when he said it and he got close to me uh -huh. and I, I, I kind of got it then that he was very angry. And I said, no, you don't look like you're joking, but you know why I parked that way. You were standing in the way. If I would have parked, pulled any closer, you would have said I hit you with my car. And he said, no, you're drunk. Give me your license. And I said, sir, I don't drink. I'm not drunk. My son's in the back seat. I'll give you a breathalyzer, but I can assure you I'm not drunk. I don't drink. So he was, he was telling me again to get off the phone. And I said, I told him again, I said, I'm not drunk. I don't drink. I don't want to get off the phone. I need the police. Something's wrong. And he said, I am the effing police. Uh -huh. And I, I need a different police because there's something wrong with you. I haven't done anything. You're accusing me of being drunk and nothing about me appears drunk. Again, he said I was drunk and asked for my license. And I said, sir, something's wrong. You're harassing me for no reason. I haven't done anything. And he said again that he wasn't going to call the police when I asked him again. And I said, well, I tell you what, I'm going to get in my car. I'm not going to leave. I'm going to lock my doors and I'm going to wait for the police. Well, when I got in my car, he followed me to my door, but I, I did hang up as I was going to the car. I dialed 911 as I was getting in the car and I did get in and lock the doors and both my windows were up. Um, he's at my window though saying, give me your license or you're going to jail. So I, I could hear him. And at first we were kind of arguing through the window. He kept saying, give me your license. I kept saying, why do you need my license? I haven't done anything. 
I don't want to interact with you anymore. I said, I just want to sit here until the police comes. You're acting like a crazy person. I don't, I don't want to deal with you. I want to deal with someone else. So yes. we're speaking through the window, but he's still saying over and over, he's saying the same thing. Give me your license or you're going to jail. So the third time that I heard him say that, I let my window down just a little bit. Oh. Uh -huh. Just to say, <laughs> again, I'm on the phone with the police. I just want to sit here. But when I let my window down, I heard him say, I'm going to tell you one more time. Give me your license or you're going to jail. I let my window down. And when I did, all I know is that is this big white arm coming through my window. He opened my door from the inside and he just snatched me out. And of course, um, I was in shock. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe that he came through the window. I couldn't believe that he touched me. I, I was just in shock. So I screamed and my son screamed. And I, I remember the first thing I said was, oh my God, what are you doing? And when he snatched me, the next thing I said was, oh my God, you can't do my arm like that. I had surgery on my shoulder a year ago. You can't do my arm like that. Mm -hmm. So when I said that, he purposely took my arm and pulled it to the other side of my body. I actually heard my arm snap mm. and I'm screaming. My son is screaming and I start telling him, please don't do this. My son can see you. And he keeps telling me your son's going to the home of the innocents and you're going to jail. I keep asking her, what have I done? Why is this happening? And he keeps telling me, you're going to jail. You're going to jail. And I'm like, I haven't done anything. So even though he has me handcuffed and he's he, he's starting to pull me across the parking lot to his car, we're talking the whole time. He snatched me up so fast that when he handcuffed me, neither of us re realized that the phone was in my hand. I still had the phone and the money in my hand that as I was walking into the store, I had those things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the whole conversation was recorded on nine one one. Nine one one was still on the phone, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So um, we're we're still the whole time going back and forth about what I've done, what have I done, and he's given he's telling me all these reasons uh, why I'm going to jail: disorderly conduct, um, resisting an officer. He's just he's naming off like. <laughs> seven or eight charges and and we're just going back and forth I'm like I I didn't do anything you told me to move my car I moved my car you were standing in the way what was I supposed to do you're harassing me I haven't done anything you're hurting me let me go so he's not letting me go so I start screaming at the top of my lungs help me somebody help me I don't know him he's hurting me my son is in the back seat I can still hear him screaming my name Mm -hmm. um, as he's dragging me across from my car to his, you can see on the video that I am obviously trying not to go. I'm trying to plant my feet so he can't move me, but he's, he's stronger than me, obviously, and he's just yanking me across. When we get over to his car, he slams me up against his car. He had already slammed me against my car. Mm -hmm. um, he slammed me up against his car, and he is trying to force me into his front seat uh -huh. by my neck. Um, I'm still screaming. At this point, people start coming. At first, there was no one on the lot. It was just like a ghost town. Well, with all the screaming that I was doing, and then I think cars, too, just started pulling into the gas station for gas. People started coming. So I'm screaming to the people, somebody help me. I don't know him. Someone get my son. And he's just talking trash to me the whole time, telling me to shut up. You're getting the people from the projects to come over here. There were no projects there. There was a hotel behind the um, gas station, but no projects. But he was saying, you're causing a scene. You're getting the people from the projects to come over here, shut your mouth. And right around that time that he's pushing me into the car, we hear sirens. We hear a bunch of sirens. So. Mm -hmm. So when he hears the, the sirens, I'm sure he was just as confused as I was because we didn't know that the phone was in my hand. You see him calm down. He, 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 he stands me up. He's standing upright and he's holding on to me and he's telling 
these guys at the gas station mm -hmm. that I told her that I would let her go if she would calm down. Mm -hmm. And I told them, no, he did not say that. Mm -hmm. He's lying. He never said that. And I was hysterical. They, they just kept saying, calm down, calm down. But I couldn't calm down after what had happened. Mm -hmm. I was I was terrified. And I had just finished fighting for my life. So calming down wasn't even an option. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, six cars, police cars came onto the scene. Mm -hmm. It was a total of 12 officers that ended up responding mm -hmm. to the scene. They immediately, when they got there, they took me from him. Uh -huh. Officers took me out of his hands, and I'm trying to explain to them that I haven't done anything, uh -huh. and I need to speak to someone, and they're just telling me that he's the arresting officer, and ma'am, just get in the car. So they put me in the back of a police car, uh -huh. handcuffed. I can still see my son from where I am, uh -huh. and obviously I'm very upset because you know they're not listening to me and um i was just scared mm -hmm. um around that time an officer comes and tells me okay we have to take your son to the home of the innocents really bothered me because i'm like you know he's nine years old mm. i haven't done anything someone needs to listen to me and he tells me um he tells me, you know, we need a family member or something to get him. And I'm like, it's five o'clock in the morning. I don't have anyone that can get him. I need to talk to someone. I haven't done anything. So I see him walking by around that time. And they're telling me that they can't do anything because he's the arresting officer. So I call him and I'm just like, sir, sir, come over here. You've got to tell them that I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. And he comes over there and he's just barking as soon as he comes over. You should have just given me your license. Why didn't you give me your license? And I told him that I saw on the news that if I feel threatened by even someone that I perceive to be a police, I have to call for backup. And he said, no, no, you have no rights. Driving is a privilege. Do you understand that? And I put my, I put my um, head down and started crying and he took my chin and and raised my head up like that and every time he said driving is a what i had to say privilege every time I put oh. my down, he took his finger and raised it back up like i was a child so 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 on top of having harassed you on top of having brutalized you on top of having caused you fear and to your child on top of we don't even know what the heck this guy was going to do to you if the rest of the people had not come right, right. So we right. don't even need to go into because that's a rabbit hole and i don't even want to go there there's a book that dr joy de mentions in one of her presentations and it's by a former officer who's talking basically about the racism that's rampant in the police and also that talks about the abuse. So he says out of however many uh, officers, there's a certain percentage, a small percentage, but the percentage still that are predators. And he talks also about the fact that out of the various uh, contacts that the police guys will make, there's a certain percentage of those contacts that are unsupervised, right? Where it's just that one lone officer. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, when you think about the odds, you know, well, there's a very small percentage, but you know, it's a percentage still that are predators and that are out there uh, looking for uh, women who are vulnerable, usually women of color, usually uh, uh, street workers. Uh, but I mean, if I'm a lone woman and I'm walking around in nowhere land, then I'm vulnerable, right? Um, right. right. So anyway, so with all of that in, you know, as background, I don't even want us to just go into that rabbit hole because we don't know what the heck this guy was going to do to you. Um, yeah. But on top of all of that, he's now to humiliate you by making you say something to him. Yeah. Actually, um, I remember very vividly that there were four officers standing behind him and I could see them and I, I knew that they could hear what he was saying and they could see what he was doing. And I remember thinking, 
why are they letting him do this? He's already humiliated me. And then he comes over there and he's going to terrorize me further and make me feel lower than low. At that time, he walked away and another officer came and everything changed from that moment on. This, uh, this sergeant, Jeremy Coleman, came and he apologized to me on behalf of Louisville Metro Police Department. Told me, we don't all act that way. I'm going to file an administrative report and you should do the same. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, they took the cuffs off of me, mm -hmm. told me that I was free to go. But of course, I couldn't even stand. Well, the officer who had just done all that to me comes back, and now he has a totally different demeanor. He, it, it was obvious that he had been taken over in the corner, and he got in some trouble. He comes back. And he's now apologetic without being without apologizing, but he has an apologetic tone. And he's just like, ma'am, um, you know, a lot of times women can be the the wildest people that we apprehend. And not only do I ha I have a very dangerous job, not only do I have to worry about people that are drunk. I have to worry about people um, on heroin. There's heroin addicts out here now. And I told him, I looked him straight in his face and I told him, you didn't think I was on heroin and you didn't think I was drunk. You hurt me for no reason in front of my son. He just stood there with his face red. And then he said, the last thing I wanted to do was lock someone up. I'm off duty. <laughs> when he said that, I was blown away by that. And I'm like, you're off duty. And he's like, yeah, well, police officers are never really off duty. And I and I told him, I get that. And if you saw me robbing the store, by all means, I would expect you to, to spring into action. Mm -hmm. If you saw me hurting someone, killing someone, spring into action. I get that. Police are never off duty. But you saw me parked crooked at a Thornton's and you snatched me out of my car? Right. He just stood there. He just stood there with the stupidest look that you can imagine on his face and his face was just as red as a bead and he's just standing there looking really dumb i already have what looks like an egg it was a it was a big cyst had already formed on my hand from where he put the handcuffs on me as tight as he could uh -huh. and so it looked like someone had slipped an egg under my hand and i actually still have it but it's really small sometimes it's bigger but it hurts uh -huh. it's a cyst that that is caused by injury sometimes. The officer helps me up, uh, Jeremy Coleman, and he walks me over to my car and we're standing there and I have a few people come and they're consoling me and asking me if I'm okay and I'm talking to my son. And the officer comes back again. This is uh, Scott Sturgeon, by the way. Scott Sturgeon is the name of the uh, aggressor here. Yes, and he actually gives me a ticket. <laughs> He gives me a ticket and tells me this is not a moving violation. It's not a big deal. It's going to go away. I already had bruises popping up. The, the cyst on my hand was gigantic. I felt like I had been beat up. So um, he offered to take us to the emergency room. But my son was, he was also a mess. The last thing I wanted to do was put him in a police car. Right. I, I told him that we would just wait and i called my son's father and um he got my son and, and we went to the emergency room from there um and just like that everybody everybody just left after the officer left before we went to the emergency room i remember just sitting there holding my son sitting on the ground just like on the curb of the store just holding him and crying um I just, more than anything, I hated that he saw all that. I, I just really hated that he saw all that. Mm -hmm. I've always kept my son away from, mm -hmm. from violence. And mm -hmm. uh, to see an officer violate me like that, it was just, it was the most horrific thing. I thought about Trayvon Martin. I thought about the fact that if my son had been just a little bit older or, or if I had a man with me, I was I thought about the fact that they would be probably laying there dead right now because mm -hmm. he would have said that he felt threatened and he would have shot them. Mm -hmm. so it was just a very um, 
upsetting situation and I, I really couldn't believe that I was in it. Which, which is uh, kind of interesting, right? This uh, concept of him feeling threatened, yet he's doing the threatening. Right. I think uh, people like, like Dr. Frances Grez Welsing in her work talks about that. This idea of the terrorizer uh, claiming to be the one who is scared. I mean, because that, we hear that over and over again. Oh, I thought he had a gun. Oh, I thought she was on heroin. Um, oh, I yeah. thought, <laughs> oh, I thought she was drunk. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, even the excuses that he came to give you later on when you said he was saying, as the police officer, I deal with so many things. Like, yeah. Well, part of the training, as far as I understand, also includes um, having the maturity and the sense to determine when you are in a dangerous situation versus when you are not, you know, yeah. when are you supposed to be helping, you know, take a cat uh, out of a tree versus when are you supposed to draw your gun because there's somebody actually directly threatening your life, right? That's part yeah. of, that's part of the training that comes with the fact of having supposedly the duty to protect the, the population, right? right? Right. People need to understand that he was not an off-duty officer at the store. He, he learned to the lot. He saw me from the street is what his is what his testimony is. Saw that I was parked crooked and decided to enforce parking while he was off duty on private property. Mm -hmm. There was no danger, no threat. I had already told him before I walked away what I was doing. So he had no reason to think that I was doing anything that would threaten him. All I wanted to do was get an assisting officer that wasn't acting like an idiot. That's all I wanted. I just wanted someone else that could make me feel safe. And then I would gladly get out of the car, talk to them, exchange whatever they needed. But he mm -hmm. made me feel threatened from the beginning. The bruise on your shoulder that I'm seeing there, is that uh, from the injuries? Oh, yes. Um, actually, I don't know if you can see this, but this big thing, my arm is completely immobilized. This is a brace that I'm wearing. It goes over my shoulder. I have to wear it 24 hours a day. I had surgery May 5th, and I've had, I have to wear it 24 hours a day for three months. I can only take it off when I shower. I even sleep in it. It's pretty ridiculous. It's, uh, if you can see it, it secures my arm here and here and it comes from on this other side of my body. All of these things on my shoulder are marks from surgery. I was actually told by, by that when I informed him of my previous injury, he was supposed to cuff me in the front. Mm. So I didn't know that, but they said that that's actually standard procedure. But he wasn't going to do that because his whole thing was about hurting me uh -huh. I know you said something earlier about we don't want to go into the rabbit hole, but I've, I've already went there myself. I know mm -hmm. that he wasn't arresting me because he didn't follow any procedures. And also uh -huh. the fact that he was putting me into his front car, his front seat. Uh -huh. I don't know of any officer that arrests people and put them in their front seat. He didn't call the police like I asked. He wouldn't give me his name. He wouldn't show me his badge. I really do think he was trying to get me out of there as quick as he could. Uh-huh. And I don't think he is going to take me to jail. Of course, I can never prove that, but I know in my heart he wasn't going to take me to jail. Right, right, right. You have been injured. It was your clavicle that is injured? Yeah, he separated my shoulder, and I had I had surgery October, two, October 7, 2013. And mm -hmm. my, my shoulder was separated. The end of my clavicle was severed, and... We got all of that taken care of. I went through eight months of therapy. Uh -huh. And so a whole year passed just about. And then we figured out, because I never got better. I was still in a lot of pain, still uh -huh. a lot of swelling, and a, almost a year had passed. So I went back to the doctor and found out June uh -huh. 2014 uh -huh. that, um, that my shoulder was unstable. They said it was unstable and that I would need something to anchor my shoulder because it was popping in and out of place. I found that out June 2014, but they wanted the money up front for the surgery and, and I didn't have it. 
So it took all the way until November 2014 to get the money. Mm -hmm. And once I got the money, the doctor's office that was seeing me abruptly released me from the practice. So then I had to find another surgeon on my own. What was that about? Well, um, <laughs> of course I can't prove this either, but uh -huh. I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um, here had contacted my lawyer and told them that they were considering paying for the surgery after um, and they said that they needed all my medical records so they could assess the damage and go ahead and pay for the surgery so I wouldn't have to suffer long. The, the county attorney is who it was, mm -hmm. uh, called and said that they were considering paying for my surgery. So get everything in, we got everything in. And I was, I felt uncomfortable about turning my medical records over to them, but I didn't want to impede my own progress. So I did turn the things over like they asked. And we kept waiting and waiting and we never heard anything. Uh -huh. um, that was back in September of 2014. Uh -huh. um, I kept calling and saying, you know, have they gotten back with you? Have they gotten back with you? And they, and they never did. They just actually never came back and said, no, we're not going to do it. But uh -huh. I went back to my surgeon. Um, I ended up getting a private person to just loan me the money. Uh -huh. And so I had the money. I just needed to have the surgery. I made an appointment. I called and said that, I had the money in that I'd like to be seen. I went in on November 11th, 2014. Mm -hmm. I waited mm -hmm. in, the waiting, wait, in the waiting room too long and I just knew something was wrong. So I said, um, you know, is, is everything okay? Is, is the doctor going to do the surgery? And he was and he was assured me because my surgeon wasn't doing the, the, the surgery. He said that the surgery was too difficult for him to do. So his partner mm -hmm. was going to do it. So mm -hmm. and he knew all along that I was waiting for the money. We always knew that that surgeon was going to do the surgery, not my original surgeon. So when he came back in and said that they weren't going to do it now, that he was refusing to do it, I was confused. And, and I told him, does he understand that I'm paying up front? Because I, I understood that, that that surgeon did not want to do surgery on a lien. The first surgery was on a lien. Uh -huh. So um, he wanted to make sure he got paid. I understood that. So I, I told the surgeon, will you please let him know, you know, that I have the money I'm paying for it up front. Does he realize that? Uh -huh. And he said, you know, he may not. So he went and he checked and he came back and he was like, he actually he does still refusing to do the surgery. I asked him why. He said that he didn't give a reason why and that he was sorry and that they were referring me out. Well, at that point, I thought I was in more pain than I could handle, but I would find out soon that it got a lot, lot worse. <laughs> so I thought I was at the end of my rope. Um, but they just wouldn't. They wouldn't change their minds. He, They handed me all of my records, even mm -hmm. had a disc for me. They had discs prepared with my x-rays and mm -hmm. all of my stuff on it. They they released me and they wouldn't give me a reason why but i in my heart i knew why uh -huh. i knew that they had been contacted by whoever from the county attorney's office or someone because these people had been keeping me comfortable from the moment we found out i needed surgery from june uh -huh. until november uh -huh. and they knew it was the police assault they knew the other surgeon was doing it i know that their their decision was persuaded some way. Let's just say that. I, I don't know how or who called. Of course, I could never say that. But I just know that they were waiting for the money. So it didn't make any sense. for Who doesn't take cash? <laughs> I, I was giving them the money for the surgery up front. Who wouldn't do that? It just didn't make uh -huh. any sense. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. the people that they referred me to, I called them immediately when I got downstairs. And I asked them, you know, I told them that I would bring them my records, that I needed surgery immediately. They told me that the doctor had to review the records before he could uh, make a decision. And I waited a whole week for them to get back with me. I kept calling. And then finally they told me that they were refusing to do the surgery also. And that for me was confirmation. Okay, 
don't go under anesthesia in Louisville, Kentucky. What if something happens? What if they do something? You know, because we're talking about the police. We're talking about these are these are not normal people that I'm that I'm going up against. Mm-hmm. It well, they have a lot of influence. So after that, I decided to try and find it, and it was hard. It was very hard to find a surgeon. But I went on a search in other cities, other states, mm-hmm. to um, to find a surgeon, and I finally did find a surgeon that agreed to do my surgery. And that's where I had surgery. I had surgery there May 5th. Mm -hmm. So from June, 2014 until May, 2015, I Uh waited and I got worse and worse. Um, Mm -hmm. My injuries got worse. I got where I couldn't hardly walk. And Mm -hmm. I I just went all the way downhill from that time until then, so. And so this whole time you have not been able to work no um since august 2013 i haven't worked i've always worked um i was also in nursing school full time at the time so i was devastated when i found out a year later i needed surgery again because i knew that that meant that would be a whole nother year that i didn't work what mm-hmm. i didn't know is that it would take all that time almost a whole nother year before i had surgery again mm-hmm. and so here i am now i just had surgery on the fifth and we're looking at a year of recovery. So for, we're going to say three years total, at least, mm-hmm. that I haven't been able to uh, work. And it, it, my life completely changed, of course, because of that. With no money, you can't do anything. So I did lose my house. And um, I sold all my furniture. Mm-hmm. I had been in the house for 11 years. That was really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I haven't been able to work because of that. I've been pretty broke and poor <laughs> this whole time. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm and I'm still not out of the woods because I I have filed for disability now, but I've been denied twice because of my age and my education is what they keep saying that at my age and my and with my education I can adjust to some other type of work even though I'm taking narcotics every day and can't use my mm-hmm. arm. So they've made it hard for me. I had a lot of work done. Mm-hmm. And so I thought my first surgery was bad, but this one is, is so much worse and I'm completely immobilized and all of mm-hmm. that. So it's going to take a lot of healing time for this one. Before this happened to me, I was um, very comfortable in a world that really almost didn't exist. I was, I was, um, I, I just didn't know that things like this happened to people like me. I, I think I, 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 I did the stereotyping when it came to these types of events. Um, I think a lot of us feel like if we're not out causing trouble or if we're not criminals and things like that, these things can't happen to us. So I was very guilty of that. Um, I, I've addressed that several times, how I was just walking around just completely stupid and thought that, oh, you know, I'm safe. And things like this only happen to people who bring those things to them because they're yeah. out here and they're, they're, they're getting in trouble because I had never had a problem with the police officer before. I actually generally have very good relationships with police officers. I've even dated a few police officers. So I I just thought I was safe. And now I know that it can happen to anyone. And, And when we look at these situations and we say, oh, well, they must have been doing something or they must have some kind of relationship with the police, that wouldn't happen to me. It's completely just stupid it's just it's ridiculous to look and think that you can be a black person and think that you um have a free pass i don't care who you are i don't i had on a suit that night i was looking very nice there's i think race is so deeply embedded in some people a lot of people and that um because of that if you run into the wrong person, mm-hmm. then you're subject to get hurt 
no matter what. You don't have to be doing anything. I know people come out with these things, what to do when you're stopped by the police. Well, I, I didn't do anything wrong when I was stopped by the police. I actually asked for backup. You can't ask those questions. If you ask those questions to somebody that already hates you uh -huh. because of the color of your skin, then they're going to do whatever they want to do no matter what you do. You can be nice, you can bow and say, yes, master, you can do whatever you want to do. It's just not going to happen. So I learned not to judge these situations. When I see them now, I'm very skeptical because of how I know they, when it came to my situation, they covered it up the way they did. It makes me feel like now I have to look at everything subjectively and say, well, it may not have happened that way. So I'm, I know that people commit crimes, but I know that everybody that's out here that the police is saying, oh, well, he had a gun. Well, he had a box knife, whatever. I know now that you better look at it a different way because it's a possibility because he did lie to try to get out of the situation with me. I was just fortunate that the charges were dropped against me, but he did try to press charges against me. That's what they do. So He's when you see these charges, what charges was he trying to press against you? Um, he said that I was parked in the handicapped space and that I didn't have a license. And he did say that that's why he was arresting me. But I found out later, you can't be arrested for parking in a handicap, even if I would have been, which I wasn't. Yeah. Um, you can only get a fine for that. And in Kentucky, you can only get a fine for not having a license. You can't go to jail for yeah. not having a license. But I did have a license. <laughs> so the charges were different. Yeah, you just smartly chose not to give it to the guy who was harassing you. That makes sense. You know, my thing was, he was in his own car, and he had on a uniform when he got out, but he wasn't acting like an officer. That was the one thing. Two, I feel like he could have gotten that uniform from anywhere. The fact that he wouldn't show me identification, to me, said something's wrong. And then his behavior, he wouldn't show me his identification all huffy and sweaty and red and getting close to me that's what made my body say okay something's wrong and so you and i had the conversation about you know living in a bubble and how so many of us just live in a bubble until some events of life just hit us upside the head <laughs> with right. a brick um for us to actually start realizing i always knew that racism existed it I knew that um, there were some white people that really felt superior. Um, so I've always known racism existed. I've always told my, my son to be better uh, as far as education than, the, than the, the white boy beside him because he has white privilege and, and, and my son doesn't have that. So I've known about that. But as far as me, like with white men, I've never had a problem with white men. White men have always been very attracted to me. Um, I think in the world, I think you get somewhat of a pass if you are, if you have a little education and, and you know how to articulate words, if you're, if you're attractive and you're lighter skin. I just, I think that you get a little bit of a pass somehow mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I've never had some of the struggles that I've heard darker skin women say they have, although they're beautiful women and it's always um, confusing to me, but they do, they, they judge you because you're darker skin and it's, it's just really ridiculous. Because of that, I've never run into anyone that I felt would just outright just disrespect me or be complete racism or prejudice. You know, I just never, I never really felt like I had anything seriously happen to me in that way because of the color of my skin. And I think that I have had a pass. When it came to this, obviously, I didn't get a pass. But... Um, I think I have went through life with the past That's because of, of those things that I can't even control anyway. So, which is unfortunate. It, it's, it's, it's really strange, but it is what it is. It does exist. People try to pretend it doesn't, but it does. Uh -huh. Right. Something else though, that yes. I learned, if, if you don't mind, 
Um, mm -hmm. I had no idea that, like I said, I've for my son, and my son is very smart. But now I realize that my son, my son is he's he's being targeted. That's something that I never thought about. I thought as long as I raised my son, he was a respectable young man and he was polite and he was, you know, all these things. As long as he wasn't walking down the street with his pants sagging, I didn't have to worry about his life. Yeah. Uh -huh. But now I know that I do have to worry about his life. It's such a, um, it's such a scary thing to know that you can, you can, actually do all the right things and uh, and still be targeted because of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. The most ridiculous thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't think that that would be the case. So my son, uh, my son just got a, a scholarship to go to, um, he's just going into the sixth grade, but he's on the, he's in the fifth grade and he's on a 10th grade level. So he, he selected to go to what would be a predominantly white school here. It's um, it's one of those high high society schools. He's going to get that better education. So it's a possibility that my son could go from there into an Ivy League school, but because he's a black boy, none of that will matter if he gets stopped by the wrong police officer. That breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. that I can raise him to do all these things and, and he can he can grow up to be even the president of the United States, but still be disrespected and demeaned and hurt because he's a black man. That mm -hmm. breaks my heart. It, and it breaks my heart to think that he's going to have, have to have the conversations. I'm sorry that I have to have with him, with his children. Mm -hmm. um, because he is a black man. He's a black boy that will grow to be a black man mm -hmm. who will have fear for his life um, when it comes to police officers. And he'll have to fight harder on every job. And he'll have to fight harder in every situation of his life mm -hmm. because he's a black boy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> that just, that really bothers me. It bothers me to know that because mm -hmm. it's so unfair. It's so unfair. He was smarter than every kid in his class. He's mm -hmm. the only one who is going to this school next year. Mm -hmm. But I, because I see this everywhere now, now I can't ignore it. I've already thought about what he's going to come up against at the school because the school is predominantly white mm -hmm. and um you know i've once your eyes are open to this i feel like my eyes have been blown and it's sad because you can't go back mm -hmm. so you see it everywhere and um and you're not as happy <laughs> ignorance <laughs> is really bliss <laughs> Right, right. Um, now you know you have to think about all these things that you didn't think about before, and now you're just like, oh God, you're dreading it. It's right. just ignorance is truly, truly bliss. That it's so, so true. Right, ignorance is bliss on, until you what until you do the accounting. Because even when while we are remaining ignorant, we're still getting hit, but we don't see it. We think, oh no, this person is just that. We think it's individual. It's in pocket. Yeah. But then when you start really seeing it, you see that it's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. Yeah. Like I'm just, I'm standing up for my rights. I, it was hard for me to believe that so many people didn't. As I got out here and heard all these stories of the horror stories, mm -hmm. and people don't tell. And, mm -hmm. and I realized part of the reason why, because I followed all the rules, I followed all the procedures, and the system still failed me. But what I know now is that it was designed to not protect me. Uh -huh. So when I went to you know, the, the people who should have made this right, when they didn't make it right for me, that was also just a rude awakening for me. So I'm fighting because they made me fight. And I don't know why anyone would take something like this lying down. If someone violates 
who you're supposed to fight. The lawsuit, I have a civil case mm -hmm. pending against the city. It is only a civil lawsuit because I was not allowed to press charges against the officer. I did try. So I have the civil case pending and I have sent my information to the Department of Justice asking them to intervene mm -hmm. um, to prosecute the officer. I am still calling for um, his removal from the police department. Actually, as early as yesterday, I did another news conference here yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we're still asking for him to be removed from his position and for him to be charged. Uh -huh. My injuries carry a felony conviction. Uh -huh. And um, I really want him to have that since he earned it. Uh -huh. um, we're not even scheduled for, for trial until August 2016. Uh -huh. So I've still got a very long way to wait for that. Um, it would be nice if something miraculous happening me would flow my way but until then i know that i have at least until then before anything happens as far as the uh, monetary damage uh -huh. for me we're only asking for monetary damage that's all we can ask for uh -huh. Uh -huh. in the civil suit uh -huh. uh, we have about no. six counts against him six that count. we're asking for it is a federal lawsuit uh -huh. when we spoke you mentioned that the reason why you were not able to press the the criminal charges uh, was because the civilian cannot press the the criminal charges. Only the prosecutor can. Can you can you tell us a little more about that? Well, um, I didn't understand until I got into this situation that you can ask the prosecuting attorney to prosecute, but that's it. Um, of course, I asked for him to be prosecuted. My lawyer. And I, uh, the office together, and we're at, we were asking for them to press charges. But what I didn't realize is that they have to agree and press charges. They can actually say no. They can say no. We're not going to press charges, and then that's supposed to be it. So, in case anybody didn't know, if someone wrongs you, the prosecuting attorney makes the decision whether or not to press charges. And if they don't want to for whatever reason, they just don't. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us about your GoFundMe campaign, please? Okay, my GoFundMe is um, so it's www.gofundme forward slash Antoinette Houston. That is essentially a campaign that Antoinette has going on that helps her to cover bills that uh, she has been left with, uh, from the, the, the assault and the ensuing uh, medical expenses and all of the snowball effect, right? Um, so you guys, please go ahead and visit the GoFundMe. Uh, and if you can donate regularly, then that's great. If you can donate in one time, a lump sum, however much uh, you can find in your heart to do. And also definitely share this, um, share this video because it's important that more people know. Um, and it's also important that more people help. Um, that's what community is about. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I hope your GoFundMe does well. And I hope that uh, the rest of your case goes as smoothly as possible, that the outcome is going to come good. Um, and uh, let's stay in touch. Okay, let's do that. Thank you. Thank you.